I don't even know where to begin. I don't even know where to start. It's coming to a point where, once again, uh, I am just con continuously, continuously in just a state of disbelief. I'm just continuing, continuously in such a state of disbelief, I, I, I never know what I want to say. I never do. I guess I guess I'll start with this. If I'm coming in a little bit differently, if you noticed a few minor changes, I have upgraded the streaming software to Melon. So I do believe that we should we should be okay as far as a a connection standpoint goes from here on out. So hopefully that takes care of that. But you, you guys already know who I am. You guys already know who I am. You guys already know what I'm all about. You guys already know what I'm capable of, what I say. You guys know what I'm good at. I, I really don't need to explain that to you. I'm pretty sure you've heard the intro enough times to know who I am and what I do and what I'm all about and all, all the other bullshit. But when it comes down to everything, when it comes down to everything, I, I'm just very, very frustrated. I, I'm frustrated. I'm fucking tired. I, I'm really, really just sick of everything. Really, I am. And more and more time goes on. I, I, I just don't know what to say anymore. I, I, I really don't. I really don't know what to say. A lot of people are going to be very, very subjective with who I am and what I do and every single content creator, every content creator and every podcaster and analyst and journalist, they're probably going to all say the same thing about how they're the best and you should be listening to them and they're the best at analyzing wrestling or they know the most about the business for whatever fucking reason because they've been in the business for X amount of years and all this other bullshit that no one could give a single fuck about. No one gives a fuck about how long you've been in the business. Nobody gives a fuck about your seniority. Nobody gives a fuck about how many fucking listeners you have. You hear me say it all the time how I'm the best. It's a very, very subjective topic. But one thing that you will not take away from me and one thing that will always, always remain true is that I am, without a shadow of a doubt, and no one will tell me otherwise, I am the most passionate wrestling fan that you will ever come across on this planet. There is no one that holds the passion, that holds the love, that holds the desire for professional wrestling as much as I do. Absolutely fucking nobody. Nobody. And I do not want to hear a single fucking peep out of anyone when it comes to that topic. I love this sport. I love this sport. I love professional wrestling. I love 
the feeling of it. I love what it has given me. There's a lot of people in this world in which they can say professional wrestling has saved their life in more ways than one. We all collectively love professional wrestling. We all collectively love how professional wrestling makes us feel, how it captivates us. Professional wrestling has literally made us feel every single emotion possible in the book of emotions. Happiness, sadness, anger, depression, excitement, anxiety, stress, everything. But we all go back to it because of the ride that it takes us on, the matches that it gives us, the story that it gives us, the fact that we see new talent come up through the rankings and give us, give us a reason to be invested in them, give us a reason to go out of our way, go out of our way and watch them because we love to see people like that succeed. I, I, I've really run out of patience. I've really run out of patience. I, I've really run out of adrenaline. But you know what? I, I guess I'm going to have to find whatever fumes of adrenaline that I have stored up in this body. And fair warning, th there will be a lot of screaming. There will be a lot of yelling. Th th there's going to be a lot of cursing in this stream. So if that's not your cup of tea, then I, I highly encourage you to Get the fuck out of the chat, wherever you're watching from. Wherever you're watching from, because at, at the end of the fucking day, I'm going to do whatever I want, and you're going to sit there, and you will like it, because this is my fucking brain. This is my fucking brain. And I will say and do whatever I want, and my words, whether you want to admit it or not, my words hold a lot of fucking weight. People love to undermine me for whatever reason, because they've been watching wrestling for longer than me or because of my youth or because they know the business. They they know how many mega millions and mega billions that WWE is going to be making and how much money they made or they want to tout about ratings. Respectfully, fuck your money. Fuck money. Fuck finances. And above all else, fuck your education. People want to come in here and they want to educate fans like me because they think that we don't know any better. They think that we're nothing but a bunch of delusional fucking marks who don't know jack shit. We don't know our fucking toenails from our nose hairs. People love to undermine us and they love to undermine the people like me for whatever fucking reason, because they have some type of egotistical God complex that they feel the need that they need to come and educate people like me. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you and all your punk asses that have been doing this, sit your silly asses down and shut your mouths. Listen while I educate you. This was supposed to be a weekend of happiness. This was supposed to be a weekend of happiness. This was supposed to be a weekend of joy. This was supposed to be a weekend where we can all collectively enjoy ourselves. This was supposed to be a weekend where we can have fun. This was supposed to be a weekend where we all come together and we enjoy what could have been and what probably will go down as one of the best WrestleManias of all time. Was it the best? No. But I mean, from an in-ring standpoint, this was probably one of the best in-ring wrestling WrestleManias that we have seen in many years. Probably since WrestleMania 31, eight years ago. WWE came out of probably the biggest high that they've come out of in a long, long time. WWE came out of a great overall two-night event that saw 
multiple match of the year candidates, storylines culminated, everything came to a head, and we got ourselves probably the best foot that WWE could possibly put forward for WrestleMania, and probably the best foot that they will put forth all year. On Monday Night Raw, after, after the main event of WrestleMania Night 2 ended, WWE took all of the good that they did. They took all of the good. They took all of the praise that we gave them. They took all of the work that all these superstars did. The triple threat match with Gunther and McIntyre and Sheamus. How great that was. Probably the best Intercontinental Championship match in the last 15 to 20 years. They took the work of Dominic and Rey Mysterio and the story that they told. The great match that Logan Paul and Seth Rollins put on. The match of the year candidate that we got from Charlotte Flair and Rhea Ripley. The match of the year candidate we got from Sami Zayn and... Kevin Owens and the Usos, the great work that Finn Balor put forth in a Hell in a Cell match against Edge, where he fucking sliced his head open to a point where you could see the insides of his fucking brain. Phenomenal main event with Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns. WWE took all of that, all of our hopes, all of our hopes, all of our prayers, and they took it all, they, they put it all in a nice, box, wrapped it up in wrapping paper, and put a nice bow on top of it, and they shit all over everything. They, they shit on our hopes, they shit on our praise, they shit on all the work that all of those individuals across both nights of WrestleMania put forth to make that show something of substance. They shit on everything. Everything. They shit on everything to a point where fire Vince McMahon was trending. Hashtag fire Vince McMahon was trending all fucking week on Twitter. Fire Vince McMahon trending all fucking week. All week. WWE announced the official sale to Endeavor. The official sale to Endeavor, which is the parent company of the UFC, in which Dana White will be serving as executive president while Vince McMahon remains in control as executive chairman. They came out in an interview with Ari Emanuel and Vince McMahon himself, who's coming out here looking like Adolf Hitler and Freddie Mercury had a love child. Then we get to Monday and Russell votes legitimately two minutes, legitimately two minutes before Monday Night Raw went on the air. Russell votes comes out and says, I'm hearing that for the first time in months. Tonight's show has a large Vince McMahon feel and presence to it. Big weekend for the boss continues. From there, we go into Monday Night Raw and reports flying everywhere in which the script was legitimately ripped up right before the show and then rewritten as the show was going on. There was supposed to be a women's triple threat match between EO Sky, Piper Niven, and Candice LeRae. That got scrapped for a tag team match between Raquel Liv Morgan and Damage Control themselves, who, by the way... We're supposed to come out with Bailey, according to Fightful, and then Bailey was fucking scrapped. Seth Rollins being told during the commercial that his segment got cut, just standing in there, having everyone sing his theme song, and then walking back within 45 seconds of Monday Night Raw coming back on the air. Sean Ross Sapp reporting that it was a rough night, and there were so much talent frustrated frustrated with what happened on Raw. 
Dave Meltzer talking about Vince McMahon was running Monday Night Raw. He's saying that he's back and it will be like it was before. And if people thought it was bad now, it's going to get even more bad. And there's nothing that they can do about it. Absolutely nothing they can do about it. Then Fightful comes out with another report saying that there were at least two WWE talents, one near the top of the card, which I'm betting is either Bailey or Seth Rollins, that said they'll likely request their releases if Vince McMahon heavily is involved going forward. And another said they'll just write out their deal. They'll just write out their deal. To be quite honest with you, I think that Vince McMahon will probably make that decision for them. Everything that we saw, and people, most of the community is aware of what's going on. Most of the community is well aware of what's going on, but there's a certain part of the community that's actually acting surprised. Certain part of the community is actually acting surprised. Let me ask you, what the fuck are you surprised about? What are you surprised about? Have you been watching the show? This didn't just come about overnight. Vince McMahon has been back since the start of 2023. Since the moment, the moment that the year started. He manipulated his way back into the company. He held, he threatened to hold the company hostage because he owns 80% of the stock. He th fucking threatened to hold the company hostage and refused, refused to sign off on the media right deals unless they let him back in. They let him back in. Their hands were tied. He then fired multiple board members. One of them, Manjit Singh, who was the lead investigator in Vince McMahon's sexual assault case. This man should be behind bars. Man should be behind fucking bars prison cell to rot. He took company funds and paid off numerous amounts of women to keep their mouths shut after he sexually assaulted them and then gave one of them to John Laurinaitis like a fucking play toy. Makes his way back into the company, completely castrates and eradicates the board of directors. Completely just destroys them. Destroys them. Then he's back. He's running the show. You can tell that the Royal Rumble was completely, completely off from what we've previously seen from Triple H in the past. Some people are actually dumb enough to blame Triple H. Some of them are actually dumb enough to fucking blame Triple H in all of this. Then he's booking matches at WrestleMania between Omas and Brock Lesnar. Then he's going out and having Bray Wyatt, which I know this has something to do with it. Bray Wyatt is starting to act more like Firefly Funhouse Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt acting like Firefly Funhouse Bray Wyatt. We saw numerous amounts of Vince McMahon terms appear on commentary, and we hear medical facility on commentary. We hear that someone needed to recut a promo backstage because they said the word wrestling. L.A. Knight, L.A. Knight hasn't won a fucking match in 2023. L.A. Knight has not won a fucking match in 2023. Why do you think that is? Think that's Triple H? No, Triple H put L.A. Knight in a feud with Bray Wyatt. He put L.A. Knight as Bray Wyatt's first feud back. He gave Bray Wyatt... L.A. Knight as his first official feud back after he was gone for a year and a half. He gave L.A. Knight a showcase to be himself. He gave L.A. Knight the room and the time on television to be L.A. Knight. And you know what happened? He got over. Everyone's, everyone's singing his fucking, saying his fucking catchphrases and saying, yeah. And everyone's saying his name with them. Everyone loves L.A. Knight. Not Vince McMahon. Vince McMahon probably was sitting here going, what the fuck is this? 
What the fuck is this? No, 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 no. We are not having L.A. Knight on television winning matches whatsoever. No, no, no. If anything, I'm counting down the minutes. I'm counting down the minutes until Vince McMahon makes the decision to bring back Max Dupree. L.A. Knight's going to be taken off of television. In comes Max Dupree. He's going to reunite with the fucking Maximum Male Models. Or worse, he's going to get fucking fired. Nick Khan and Triple H blatantly lying, lying, and bullshitting the media. All these fucking reports saying the same fucking garbage. Meanwhile, you don't need Fightful, you don't need Meltzer, you don't need PW Insider or Ringside News or anyone. Just watch what is going on on Raw. Watch what is going on on SmackDown. How can anyone sit here and the majority of the community is actually on my side here, but how could anyone sit here and blame Triple H? How could anyone sit here and think that everything is fine? It's not! In one night, all it took was one night, Vince McMahon reportedly back to visit John Cena. Meanwhile, he had a headset on all night. Had a headset on all night. All it took, all it took was one show. One fucking show for Vince McMahon to completely fucking eradicate. Eradicate and erase everything that Triple H has done and kill all fucking hope. No one, absolutely no one should be quick to forgive after what we saw. No one, and I mean absolutely nobody, should be in support of WWE. And if you are, you're the fucking problem with the community. I gotta be scrolling on Twitter, and I gotta see a fucking tweet from Busted Open Radio and Bully Ray sucking the WWE dick, because that's all he knows how to do. And I'm sitting here wondering how anyone could sit here and take this fucking old-ass motherfucker seriously. How can anyone sit there and be okay with what we got? I feel terrible. I feel terrible for Triple H. And people trying to make excuses that this was Triple H. Did you see the look on Triple H's face coming out of WrestleMania Night 2 on that post-media scrum? Did you see the look on his face? He looked defeated. He looked defeated as I've ever fucking seen him. He looked defeated. He looked pissed off. He looked like he did not even want to be sitting there at the WrestleMania night two post media scrum, the press conference. He looked like he just wanted to get the fuck out of there. He did not even acknowledge anyone. All he did was keep a straight face moping around. He looked miserable. But this is Triple H's work. This is Triple H's work. I feel terrible for Triple H. And you know who else? You know who else I feel bad for? I feel bad for every single individual that had to deal with all of the bullshit that Vince McMahon put on them only to be rehired and given a second chance by Triple H, given a second fucking chance by Triple H and all of that shit, all the opportunities, all the chances, everything, every last bit of hope that they had, everything went up in smoke. What do you think's going to happen to Dakota Kai and EO Sky? I wouldn't be shocked if damage control, there's, there's reports going around that damage control ha has potentially been split up. There's reports going around that they've potentially been split up. Reports going around that they've potentially been split up. And reportedly, reportedly, Bailey is no longer going to be involved with them. What's going to happen with Dakota Kai and EO Sky? Vince McMahon probably purposely sent them out there to see how they would favor without Bailey. And when they're not getting the reactions that they should be getting, although they weren't really doing too much before, they weren't really doing too much before because at the end of the fucking day, damage control, damage control was a failure from the start. Because Vince McMahon, Vince McMahon, he had nothing to do with it, but Triple H, Triple H 
That was probably his biggest failure under his reign as creative. Under the nine months that he was running creative, damage control was probably his biggest failure. They were never treated right. Now Vince McMahon is going to look at Dakota Kai and EO Sky, and he's going to be like, oh, you can't get over on your own, right? You can't get over without Bailey. You can't survive without Bailey. Guess what? You're gone. Dakota Kai and EO Sky and Tegan Knox and Shayna Baszler. What about fucking Candice LeRae and Mia Yim? Piper Niven is no longer named Dewdrop. What about her? What about her? What about Bronson Reed? Bronson Reed, they've done nothing with Bronson Reed yet. Bronson Reed came in as soon as Vince McMahon came back. What's going to happen with Bronson Reed, Dexter Loomis, Johnny Gargano, all these individuals that were given opportunities under Triple H, individuals that haven't even scratched the surface of what they can do. We haven't even gotten started. We haven't even gotten started as to what's going to happen with Gargano and Reed and Loomis and all these other individuals. Braun Strowman given a new lease on life since he came back. What about Imperium? Imperium. The Brawling Brutes. Bray Wyatt himself. All these individuals. What about what about the individuals that were given a second chance? Individuals that were dead in the water. What about the Judgment Day? Look at the Judgment Day. The Judgment Day has morphed itself into legitimately the best act on television. On Monday Night Raw, Judgment Day, before Cody Rhodes came back and before Sami Zayn rose to prominence, the Judgment Day was the best thing on Monday Night Raw. The Judgment Day came in, and the Judgment Day was completely fucking treated like shit under Vince McMahon. And then in comes Triple H. Finn Balor has risen back to prominence. Damien Priest is doing great work. Dominic Mysterio is a heat fucking magnet. Look at Rhea Ripley. Look at Rhea Ripley. Rhea Ripley has morphed herself into the greatest act in the women's division. She won the Women's Royal Rumble. She beat Charlotte Flair a week ago at WrestleMania night number one. Now what's going to happen to her now that Vince is back in charge? Charlotte Flair may be off doing a bodybuilding contest now, but what happens when she comes back? I give Rhea Ripley till SummerSlam as the SmackDown Women's Champion with Vince in charge. And you know what? That might even be being generous. Bray Wyatt came back to finish his story and start a new chapter in his life. And as soon as 2023 hits, the pitch black match absolutely shits the bed. He goes into a program with Bobby Lashley in which they have nothing to fucking do with one another. What about Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens? What about them? Look at where they were a year ago under Vince McMahon. Kevin Owens, Kevin Owens was doing a job for Stone Cold Steve Austin. He was losing to Stone Cold Steve Austin in the main event of WrestleMania 38, night number one last year. Losing to Stone Cold Steve Austin after he came back after 19 years of being retired, and then he was put in a fucking feud with Ezekiel. Kevin Owens was put in a feud with fucking Ezekiel. Kevin Owens, job to Stone Cold, feuded with Ezekiel for fucking four months. What about Sami Zayn? Sami Zayn was losing a fucking jackass comedy match at WrestleMania to Johnny Knoxville. Then he joins the bloodline and he wasn't even supposed to be a long-term character in the bloodline. He wasn't even supposed to be a long-term character in the bloodline. They were probably going to kick him out after SummerSlam. Triple H came in and Sami Zayn resurrects his career and becomes the hottest baby face in the fucking business. And they just beat the Usos for the tag team titles. What do you think will happen to them now? Do you have any faith that Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn are going to be safe from Vince McMahon? Look at where they were a year ago under Vince. I'd be fucking worried. I'd be worried about Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn after what we saw on Monday Night Raw.
There's a lot of people that owe me and everyone like me who said what we said. A lot of people owe me a big fat fucking apology. And they owe a lot of individuals, a lot of individuals who fucking bitched and moaned and complained and voiced exactly what I'm saying. Voiced exactly what I'm saying, wondering what the fuck is going on and why is Vince back? All you need to do is watch what's going on. Vince McMahon has fucking ruined the WWE in just one night. Oh, and don't, don't think, don't you dare fucking think that just because we got a decent episode of SmackDown last night on Friday, don't think for one single fucking second that just because we got a decent episode of SmackDown, that means that we're in the clear. And yes, we got a WWE draft announced. We got a WWE draft announced. Do you, do you have any faith that they're going to do right by the draft? No. We don't even need a fucking draft. We don't even need a fucking draft. The roster is not cut out for a draft anymore. Six years ago it was. But after how many people they fired and how many people either went to Impact or AEW or how many individuals just decided to leave because they were being mistreated in WWE, how much faith do you really have that after the roster has virtually been depleted, 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 even with the returns, how much faith do you have that WWE is going to do right by the draft? They need to stand up to the fucking networks and say, hey, Fox, hey, USA, sit down and let us do what we need to do. We are giving everyone free reign to appear on both shows so that way your shows will be better, the ratings will be up, the revenue will be up, and everything will flow much nicer than it was flowing with a draft. How is a draft going to help? We don't need a draft. We need the brand split to end. Some people are saying that Vince is running Raw and Triple H is running SmackDown. You know what? Let's just say hypothetically that is true. How long do you think that's going to last? If you guys remember, uh, during the initial draft back in 2016, Triple H and Ryan Ward were running SmackDown Live. They were running it like NXT Black and Gold. Matter of fact, some people actually said that it was better than NXT Black and Gold at the time. Minus the takeovers. Minus the takeovers. Some people were saying that SmackDown Live back in the day was better than NXT Black and Gold. It was better than NXT Black and Gold. Vince McMahon caught wind of this. They beat Monday Night Raw in the ratings. What happened after WrestleMania 33? Vince McMahon seized control of it, and he gave fucking Jinder Mahal the WWE Championship which nearly killed the brand and nearly killed all the prestige for the WWE Championship because they thought that it would help the revenue and help the, the income from India. Meanwhile, nobody from India gives a fuck about Jinder Mahal. He wasn't even the most popular act from India. More people cared about fucking Roman Reigns during that time than they cared about Jinder Mahal. And Roman Reigns was in the midst of of a fucking terrible babyface run. That was years before the Tribal Chief. And more people cared about Roman at the time than they cared about Jinder Mahal. I guess representation ain't that important in wrestling now, is it, motherfuckers? There's a lot of people that owe me and others a long, long drawn-out thought apology. Don't you ever, don't you ever fucking tell me what's going on. Because half the time, you, and I'm talking about everyone, everyone that's telling me, everyone that's telling me and others, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You're a fucking mark. You're delusional. Don't you dare fucking tell me how I should be looking at things. Just because you've been in the business or just because you know all these fucking finances and all this fucking money that WWE's making and you can keep track of the fucking ratings because you're a fucking moron with nothing else better to do in your life, that don't mean you don't know shit. You do not know shit. Fuck your money. Fuck your seniority. Fuck your time in the wrestling business. You don't know shit. I am a hell of a lot smarter than most. 
I can see what others can't see. I know what others don't know, and it's about time that everyone starts listening to this fucking kid from Jersey. Because unlike you, I don't need to bend over and take the WWE dick eight inches up my ass. Doesn't really help that most people have their heads so far up their own ass that they brush their teeth with toilet paper. Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes. There were reports going around that Cody Rhodes losing at WrestleMania was the plan all along. I don't believe that bullshit for one fucking second. I don't believe that bullshit for one single solitary fucking second. If you take a look at the story that they were telling and everything that led up to WrestleMania, everything, everything pointed towards Cody winning. Yes, it may be WWE and they love to swerve their audience and they love to play us for fools and try and make sure that they are unpredictable in the worst way possible. But sometimes the most predictable outcome is the best outcome. But I don't believe for one second that Cody Rhodes losing to Roman Reigns was the plan all along. What fucking reason do they have for that plan to go forth? I don't think you guys really understand that there are more negatives than positives with Cody losing rather than Cody winning. As far as I see it, there has only been one positive, one positive that people have been bringing forth to the table as far as Cody losing. There is only one positive with Cody losing. The only, the only fucking positive with Cody losing is that we're going to get another great story and we're going to get another great match. We're, get, we're, get, we're going to get Cody struggling to fight his way back up to the top in order to beat Roman Reigns again. And yes, it's going to be a great story. It will be a great story. I trust Roman. I trust Cody. Is it going to be a great match? Yeah, it'll be a great match. But I don't think people are really branching out and discussing all the other overbearing negatives about Cody losing. I don't believe for one second that this was the plan all along. Everything, every sign in that story pointed towards Cody winning. Roman Reigns and his world title reign has reached its peak. There's nowhere left for Roman to go. He's done legitimately everything there is to do. He's done everything. What more is there for Roman Reigns to do? Roman Reigns came out in the media scrum and he said, oh yeah, we're just scratching the surface. Scratching the fucking surface. Scratching the fucking surface. You made a hole fucking a thousand feet deep. The surface has been scratched far beyond belief. What more is there for the bloodline to do other than feud with each other? There's nothing left. Anything else would just be them going around in circles. How can anyone believe that Cody losing from the get-go was the plan? Why? Just because Roman Reigns is Roman Reigns? Just because he's been that dominant? There was no better time to do it. And this is another, another piece of information that no one is talking about. The moment, the match... The setting, the story, the crowd reaction, the anxiety, the, the, the feeling, the vibe of it all. Everything, the stars were aligned. The stars were perfectly aligned in a fucking row. Not one single star out of place. Everything was aligned picture perfectly. The moment, the match, the vibe, the feeling, the story. The, the arena, the, the venue, the show, everything was aligned perfectly for Cody to win. And it would have been a WrestleMania moment that would have lived in the annals of history. It would be a moment that would have lived in the annals of history if they pulled the trigger. How can you look at the match and the moment and the setting and say, oh, it wasn't Cody's time yet. Oh, it wasn't the time. Oh, Roman Reigns retaining was the right outcome. Oh, yeah, they're going to tell a great story. They're going to, they, it needed more of a story. 
It needed more of, of, of a struggle for Cody Rhodes to be that underdog babyface. What? As if 950 days of Roman Reigns as the world champion wasn't enough? That was the story. That was the struggle. Roman Reigns being built up to be this unstoppable monster. Roman Reigns resurrecting his career, becoming such a fantastic heel, putting on some of the best matches that we've seen in the modern era, and becoming a legend as the tribal chief. Roman Reigns deserves all the flowers that he gets, but at the end of the day, 950 days, that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough of a build. That wasn't enough of a story. Cody Rhodes and his 17-year journey, his 17-year career to finally main eventing WrestleMania and getting a world title shot on the grandest stage of them all, that wasn't enough. You're merely looking at what happened between the Rumble and WrestleMania. You're not looking at everything else before then. It's just WWE's fault that they didn't highlight it in the way that he should have. No one, no, no one is saying that Roman Reigns is not good at what he does. I mean, if you do that, if you do that, you're a fucking idiot. You're really a fucking idiot. I, I, I really don't have any time to debate whether or not Roman Reigns deserves his flowers. He absolutely does. He absolutely does. Roman Reigns is not the problem here. Roman Reigns has become a fucking legend with the Tribal Chief gimmick. He's put on some fantastic matches, and he has solidified himself as one of the greatest of our generation. But at the end of the day, what more can he do? What more can he do? What more can you book him to do? Everything was perfectly aligned for Cody to win, and they will never get that back. It doesn't matter how many excuses you want to give me. It doesn't matter how many fucking excuses you want to come up with as to whatever. Cody wasn't ready, or this wasn't the right time, or we, we, we need to give Cody more of a story and more of a struggle. What more do you want? You're never going to get that moment back. That was the moment that would have lived in history. If that happens at SummerSlam, if that happens at fucking Clash at the Castle, if that happens at Money in the Bank or Extreme Rules or the Rumble, it will not come close to the impact. Hence, the emphasis on the word impact that it would have had. It would have never come close to the impact that it would have had if it was done at WrestleMania. And it will never be duplicated. That's the fucking point that people do not seem to comprehend. These people making excuses. They don't get it. They don't get it at all. That was the moment that would live forever. Now if Roman Reigns loses it at SummerSlam to Cody Rhodes, what's going to happen? Is it going to be a great match? Yeah. Would it be a great moment? Sure. Is it going to have an impact? Yes. Will it have the biggest impact? No. On top of that, every single individual that Roman faces before he gets to a rematch with Cody Rhodes, it's going to be predictable as shit. Every single individual that Roman faces en route to a rematch with Cody Rhodes is going to take a big fat fucking L. They put Bobby Lashley in front of him, L. Sheamus in front of him, L. Ricochet in front of him, L. Braun Strowman, L. AJ Styles, L. L, 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 L. Or else, what, what's he going to do next? Is he going to take a fucking vacation? Is he going to take a fucking vacation for four months until SummerSlam? You passed on Cody's moment and a match and a moment and a story and a setting that will never be duplicated, will never be recreated for what? A fucking thousand day record that ultimately no one is going to give a fuck about in the end. They're just going to give a shit about how and when Roman loses the championship. We don't care how long it was. We don't care when it started. We care about what you are going to do with said championship and said title reign that is going to help create the next star. That's the point 
that people don't seem to fucking get. And then there are people that want to use the fucking money excuse. People want to use the fucking money excuse saying, oh, they just sold the WWE to Endeavor for 9.3, nearly $10 billion. They gotta have Roman Reigns as the champion because he's the top fucking draw. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but according to Fightful, Cody Rhodes was the number one merchandise seller. He was the number one merchandise seller all WrestleMania weekend, surpassing Drew McIntyre, Gunther, Roman Reigns himself, the Bloodline, Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, Rhea Ripley, Judgment Day, Seth Rollins, Charlotte Flair, everybody. But yet we need Roman Reigns as the champion. This, this company is going to make money despite themselves. You don't need fucking Roman as the champion. How many mega billions are they getting paid by Saudi Arabia just to fucking show up? Just to fucking show up. They don't need Roman as the champion in order to make money. They're going to make money regardless. They're the WWE. Punk even said it himself. The company is going to make money despite themselves. They don't need Roman Reigns as the world champion in order to get paid all these mega billions. What a fucking stupid excuse. What a stupid fucking excuse. Why do we need to always revert back to the money excuse? Why do we need why do we need to always revert back to finance and shit? Fuck that. Fuck that. Money and finances and all these mega billions and ratings, it will not excuse the fact that the WWE when Vince McMahon is in charge, Vince McMahon's WWE is shit. Triple H's WWE is where we have the good stuff. That is how a wrestling company should be run. It doesn't change the fact that no matter how many billions that they make, it will never justify the quality of the television show. If the quality is bad, it is bad, and money will not be able to justify it. I don't give a shit who you are or what excuses you want to make. And if you're one of these people making excuses, you are the cancer of the IWC, and you are no better than Vince McMahon. And I have absolutely no respect for you whatsoever because you, you are ruining the one thing, one of the biggest things in this world that makes me happy. You think I want to sit here and do this? You think I want to sit here and bitch and moan and yell until my voice goes hoarse? No, I want to sit here and I want to be happy. I want to relax. I want to be happy. I want to be thankful. Thankful that I'm watching a good professional wrestling promotion. And you, people that defend this company with how many fucking mega millions that they're making, they sit there expecting us to take this shit, kneel down on our knees, open up our mouths, and take WWE's dick fucking us in our throats. That's what they expect. They expect us to be sheep. They expect us to be brain dead fucking zombies. They expect us to be fucking whores to WWE's shit booking, taking it in. Fuck that. Fuck that and fuck you too. And then we got Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar attacking Cody Rhodes. Monday Night Raw. People have been saying that it's probably the worst Monday Night Raw after WrestleMania of all time. I'm not even covering anything WWE related on this show. I'll pick it up again next week. I'll pick it up again next week. I am not even bothering. I am not even going to bother. Not even going to bother covering anything WWE related. Nothing. The only two things that happened this week on WWE television, as far as a backlash build is concerned, the only two things of substance that we got as far as a build towards the next pay-per-view were Damian Priest choke slamming Bad Bunny through a table, which I believe is going to result in a tag team match between Bad Bunny, Rey Mysterio taking on Dominic Mysterio and Damian Priest. And number two, Matt Riddle saved Sami Zayn from an attack from the bloodline last night on SmackDown, which is probably going to result in a six-man tag at Backlash between Matt Riddle, Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, The Usos, and Solo Sokoa which I have no problem with whatsoever. Outside of that, what the fuck happened this week on WWE television, even with a decent episode of SmackDown last night? 
Brock Lesnar attacked Cody Rhodes. People were saying that this was the plan all along. No, it fucking wasn't. This wasn't the plan for a month before WrestleMania. What the fuck does Brock Lesnar have to do with Cody Rhodes? Their paths haven't crossed once. The only time that I think their paths ever crossed was when Brock Lesnar was in a pull-apart brawl and Cody Rhodes was one of the individuals that was probably pulling Brock Lesnar off of a John Cena or pulling Brock Lesnar off of a fucking Undertaker during whatever program Brock Lesnar was in at the time. A pull-apart brawl with Cena, pull-apart brawl with The Undertaker. That was it. That was the only time that Brock Lesnar and Cody Rhodes were even in the, were even in the same fucking arena together. What the fuck does Brock Lesnar have to do with Cody Rhodes? People trying to make excuses of, oh, it's a money program. Money program? Money fucking program. I don't recall anyone ever saying, man, I want to see a program between Cody Rhodes and Brock Lesnar. The program doesn't even make any fucking sense. What the fuck are they fighting over? What beef does Brock Lesnar have with Cody Rhodes? There is no beef. There is no beef at all. And then on SmackDown, on SmackDown last night, Wade Barrett is given this fucking dumbass excuse. This dumbass fucking excuse. Oh, Brock Lesnar was pissed off because he had to kick off night two of WrestleMania. Yes, yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not fucking bullshitting you. If you miss SmackDown, Wade Barrett said on commentary, Brock Lesnar was pissed off that he had to open night two of WrestleMania. Are we watching a professional wrestling show or are we in fucking kindergarten here? That is perhaps, that is, I'm not even fucking exaggerating. That is the dumbest, the dumbest reason that I have ever fucking heard. That is the dumbest excuse that I have ever fucking heard for another wrestler going out of their way to attack another one and start up a feud with another one. Brock Lesnar was pissed off that he had to open night two, so he took it out on Cody Rhodes. That is like a fucking kindergartner in a line, and the teacher assigned him to be the line leader, and the kindergartner is going, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to be the line leader, Mrs. And Mrs. Anderson. Go, 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 make, go make Steven the line leader. I want to be somewhere in the middle of the, of the line. I don't like being the line leader, Mr. Anderson. Ah, what the fuck are we watching? What, what is this shit? How the fuck is anyone supposed to be invested in a Brock Lesnar, Cody Rhodes program if they're giving us the excuse that Brock Lesnar attacked Cody because he was pissed off that he fucking opened the show? That is the most juvenile shit I have ever fucking heard. Absolutely fucking atrocious. What is this shit? Vince McMahon logic. Vince McMahon logic littered up and down the shows. Cody Rhodes losing when he shouldn't have lost and then entering into a nonsensical program, a program that makes no fucking sense with, with Brock Lesnar. Then on top of that, on top of that, we got fucking Liv Morgan and Raquel Rodriguez in a tag team match after they lost. They lost at WrestleMania to Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler. And... Now they're in a number one contenders match with damage control to see who's going to fight for the women's tag team titles against Becky and Lita next week on Raw. Why? What sense does that make? Omos. Omos and Elias is the first match that we see on Monday Night Raw. The first thing that we see from an in-ring wrestling standpoint on Monday Night Raw after a great opening segment with Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns. And we see fucking Omos and Elias, two of the most dead acts, the, 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 the deadest of the dead as you could get when it comes to acts on television. Why the fuck is Omos still employed? Lost to Brock Lesnar. Lost to Bobby Lashley. Lost to Braun Strowman. 
He's a fucking seven foot four jobber. And people still want to make excuses as to whatever value Omas has. Let me tell you something, you dumb sons of bitches. It ain't the fucking 80s anymore. Omas has no fucking place in professional wrestling. Unless a big guy can do what Wardlow is doing on AEW television, I don't want anything to fucking do with them, and neither should you. We're going back to the fucking Stone Age with Omas. This is what people are trying to defend. Trying to defend Omas. If you are one of these people defending Omas, you are legitimately one of the dumbest motherfuckers on the face of this planet. Straight up retarded. Omas is the first thing that we see from an in-ring standpoint on Monday Night Raw. Following one of the biggest and most successful WrestleManias ever. Vince McMahon... Shit on everything. Just shit on our hopes, shit on our praise, shit on all the work that everyone put forth to make WrestleMania into something special. I could have legitimately sat here an hour ago and say, I told you so. And then I would have talked about Dynamite and Rampage and Battle of the Belts, and I would have been out of here by 2, 2.15 at most. I don't even I don't even believe that I that I have to waste my time talking about this shit. WWE is fucking lucky. They're fucking lucky that I have this brand because if I didn't, I wouldn't be watching one solitary fucking minute of WWE television. The only reason why I am is because people enjoy me ripping this company several new assholes on a weekly fucking basis. That's the only reason why I watch. I watch to see how bad it is, so that way I can rip it apart and everyone here will get their money's worth. Everyone here will get their time worthwhile when they come in here on a Saturday when they could legitimately be doing anything else and they decide to watch me. I got to give them what they came here to see. Quality wrestling analytics and quality entertainment. That's what I'm all about. Thank God for Tony Khan. Listen, he, he's not perfect. He's got his own problems to worry about. There's a lot of room for improvement, and we're going to talk about that this week. Trust me. Rampage and Battle of the Belts wasn't perfect by a long shot. We're going to talk about it. We will. But at least, at least he is giving us what we came to see. At least... He is booking a wrestling promotion for the fans. He is booking for the fans and people want to shit on him for whatever fucking reason. There's a lot of room for criticism with AEW, but Tony Khan gets way too much shit. He gets way too much shit and he is honestly probably the most unnecessary hated figure in the entire wrestling community. Thank God that we at least have one individual that actually gives a shit about professional wrestling and gives a shit about his employees and is giving us, the fans, at least something of substance. While it may not be perfect all the time, at least he is giving us something to look forward to on a weekly basis. He books a wrestling promotion for the fans. He doesn't treat his fans like fucking idiots. He makes sure... He makes sure that we get our money's worth. And he actually does something that Vince McMahon refuses to do. He puts effort into his programming. Fucking sad, man. It, it really is sad. Really. I, I really don't know what else I could say. I really don't know what else I could say. People make excuses left and fucking right. People defend this company as if their life fucking depends on it. People defend this company as if their life depends on it. I mean, what the fuck is going through your mind? What the fuck is going through? What are you trying to prove? Why is it that you are so afraid? Why is it that some people are so afraid 
to say anything negative about WWE? Why is it that some people just cannot remove the WWE dick from their mouths and call them out when they do wrong? Because coming out of WrestleMania night two, Monday Night Raw was as wrong as you could possibly get. There was absolutely no fucking reason outside of that very good tag team match with the Street Profits and Sami Zayn. No fucking reason to praise that show. Logic gaps everywhere. Rewrites everywhere. No fucking substance at all. Vince McMahon single-handedly is killed the Raw after WrestleMania. A show that is looked at as probably the best show, the best Monday Night Raw of the year, has now turned into the worst Monday Night Raw of the year, thanks to a senile old fuck that will not, it's, he's like a fucking cockroach, just will not fucking go away, with his fucking Adolf Hitler Freddie Mercury mustache, just will not go away. People really, really need to wake the fuck up. There's a lot of people that really need to wake the fuck up. They really need to understand that this company does not deserve their praise. You are being used. You are being used. You are being manipulated. And people, some people actually said, oh, no, Brock Lesnar attacking Cody Rhodes. It's a money storyline. You know, I actually brought to the table that Vince McMahon may have manipulated Cody Rhodes to come back, thinking that this time could very well be different. Thinking that this time could very well be different, and now he's taking out his frustrations and he's punishing, he's punishing Cody Rhodes for going to AEW and starting a rival promotion and doing shit better than he did, and he's making Vince look like a fucking amateur, like Brian Danielson said on Wednesday. Amateurs! He's made, he made Vince look like a fucking amateur with the way that he booked Cody Rhodes the first time around. Now, I'm not saying that, that that is exactly what is going on, but if you don't think that that is a possibility, if you don't think that that has some weight, if you don't think that Brock Lesnar attacking Cody Rhodes would be a form of punishment by Vince McMahon for Cody Rhodes upstaging Vince with AEW, you got another thing coming. This is the same man that broke Demolition's record with the New Day because at the time, Demolition was going through a lawsuit with WWE. This is the same man that squashed AJ Lee and had Nikki Bella break her record as the longest reigning Divas champion because she was married to CM Punk. This is the same company that put Lana through a table every single week for two months because Miro came out on Dynamite and bashed WWE. How do you sit there and not think that it's a possibility? How the fuck do you sit there and not think that it's a possibility that Vince would use Lesnar to attack Cody Rhodes and flip off a double burden birdie to Cody Rhodes as a punishment for starting up AEW? How? Are you are are you are, are these people legitimately that fucking stupid? Are you that fucking stupid? You, some of these people, they really need to have their fucking head examined. Really. I, I, I do not believe that I, that I breathe the same air as some of these fucking retards. Sick of people undermining me because of my youth. Sick of people undermining me because of my youth. I'm sick of people insulting my intelligence because, oh, I haven't been in the business. I don't need to be in the business to know what's a good match and to know what's a bad match. And I have every right to say what I say. And what I say, let me tell you something. Whether you want to admit it or not, you can call me condescending. You can call me ignorant. You can call me a fucking dick. I don't care. I don't care because I know that in the end, no matter what happens, I am ultimately going to be proven right. And you, at the end of the day, will look like a fucking dickwad. You, at the end of the day, will look like a fucking WWE shill. You, at the end of the day, will look like a retard. I know at the end of the day that what I'm saying is as factual as you could fucking get. I'm going to say it once again. It is about time that people start listening to me. It is about time that people 
check their fucking selves, check themselves, sit down, shut their fucking mouths, open their fucking ears, and start listening to me. I know a hell of a lot more than you think. And I know exactly what I'm watching on television. And I don't need anybody to tell me different. Let me take a sip of my ice water. A joke. It's all a joke. We're going to talk about AEW Dynamite. I had to get all that shit out. I really did. I I, I needed to get all that shit out because it, it, it's just fucking ridiculous. It, it really is. It, it, it's fucking ridiculous that I, I need to sit here and... And I need to explain this shit to you. Explain this shit to people as if, as if I'm, I'm explaining it to fucking preschoolers. It's unbelievable. People really need to fucking open your eyes. Thank you guys for joining. Wasted over a fucking hour doing that shit. We're going to talk about AEW, AEW Dynamite, Rampage, and Battle of the Belts before we get out of here. And we're actually going to talk about a wrestling show that is not a waste of our time. A real wrestling show. How a wrestling show should be booked. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to Lisa. Thank you to Philly Talk Sports. Thank you to Lady Kenzie. Thank you very much. You guys are awesome. You guys have been great. And I hope you guys are having a good time. I hope you guys are having a good time. We are going to get into the Dynamite review. And Dynamite Dynamite gave us more of a Raw after WrestleMania than Monday Night Raw actually gave us a Raw after WrestleMania. We were originally set to kick off the show with Juice Robinson and Ricky Starks when all of a sudden the Switchblade, Jay White, showed up, delivered a Blade Runner to Ricky Starks, and Juice Robinson played Ricky Starks for a fool, and it looks like we will indeed be getting a Jay White versus Ricky Starks program, and I have absolutely no issue with that. I do have some news on Jay White, actually. Jay White. Jay White, according to PW Insider, stating that there was absolutely no discussion of former New Japan Pro Wrestling star Jay White within WWE at all over WrestleMania 39 weekend. It also now appears that White is not WWE bound based on conversations PW Insider have had with WWE officials and wrestlers. Oh, you think? You think? I wonder what changed. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah that's right. A fucking senile sexual predator manipulated his way back into the company and pretty much nixed all of Jay White's hopes towards coming to WWE. But I don't know what changed. What changed? Jay White is all elite, and he said, fuck Vince McMahon, I don't need this shit. Fuck Vince, I don't need this shit. I'm going over to Tony Khan, and I'm going to do some great shit over there with my friends and with every other person on that roster. And Jay White, he's versatile as fuck. You could put him anywhere. You could put him on AEW, Ring of Honor, put him on Rampage, anywhere. He'll fit like a glove. He's great. Jay White attacks Ricky Starks, and it looks like we could be headed towards a Jay White versus Ricky Starks match at Double or Nothing, which I have no problem with at all. I think that is a great move. I think that's a very good move. So from there, from there, uh, we saw, we saw ourselves 
a trios match with the House of Black best friends and Orange Cassidy. This is for the AEW World Trios Championships. This was a very fun match. Very fun match. The House of Black is looking strong. House of Black is winning matches. And the House of Black retained the Trios Championships. No reason why the Trios Championships were going to be taken off of the House of Black. House of Black are going to be holding those titles for a decent amount of time. So Brody, he squished Chuck Taylor against the barricade. Cassidy was then slammed headfirst onto the apron. Trent was powerbombed on the apron. The House of Black won control. Everyone started taking out everyone. Brody Lee was... He was in control with a boss man slam. We had a brain buster by Malachi Black on Chuck Taylor. We had a pile driver by Trent on Black. Pile driver on Buddy. Pile driver on King. Black saved the match. A couple of back and forth counters before Buddy Matthews delivered a stomp to Chuck Taylor to retain the AEW World Trios Championships. And you know what? I like, I like the fact that Buddy Matthews got the win here. I like the fact that Matthews got the win here because normally we would see a Malachi Black get a victory like that considering that he's the leader of the House of Black, but they're giving the other members of the House of Black more shine. Brody Lee, Brody King's been getting some shine on Rampage. He's been winning matches. We've been getting some shine between Matthews. He's been getting some shine in some singles matches. He retained the trio championships for his group. I like the fact that they're giving... Buddy Matthews, more of a shine. I think that's a great move. I'll tell you what else is great. Riho and Jamie Hayter for the AEW Women's World Championship. We had some very nice material here. Riho, here's what I will say. Riho, I'm not, I'm not the, the biggest mark for Riho. I'm not, I'm not really a big fan of Riho. But Riho, I, I think that people should really start giving Riho a little bit more credibility and a little bit more, a little bit more support because Riho, Riho is very good at what she does. Riho can wrestle, and you put her in the ring with anyone. Riho will give you a good match. Riho will give you a good match, and that right there, that is something to be respected. That is really something to be respected. So Riho came in with a diving crossbody on the floor to Jamie Hader. We had a gut buster by Hader for a two. Both women were on the apron. Jamie Hader with a urinagi on the apron for a two. Back in the ring, coming back in commercial, Riho with a 619, diving crossbody for a two. German suplex by Riho. Dragon suplex as well for a two. Diving foot stomp missed. Neck breaker on the knee by, by Jamie Hader and a sliding lariat for a two. Up on the top. Riho delivered a big hurricane run off the top to Jamie Hader. Running knees, but Jamie Hader got her foot on the rope. Back and forth counters we go. We got a Hader raid, but Riho kicked out off of the first Hader raid. Riho was then on the receiving end of a second Hader raid, and Jamie Hader retains the women's championship in what was a very, very good women's match. Probably, probably the best match of the night, according to some. Riho does not get enough credit, and I do believe that people should start giving Riho a little bit more props. The JAS. JAS. This was Daddy Magic, Cool Hand, Angelo Parker, and we had Jake Hager out there too. So Daddy Magic, who is probably, he, I think he's becoming one of my favorite acts on television right now. This was probably my second favorite part of the show, just because of how outlandish it was. Daddy Magic, in in the most outlandish way possible, he goes, he goes, do you want to know what makes Daddy Magic's nipples hard? And the crowd was doing it with him. The crowd was doing it with him. So Matt Menard is actually, he's actually becoming, becoming a little bit more popular. I like that. I like that. So he goes, how about the acclaimed joining the JAS? The acclaimed then came out and denied the acceptance. Angelo Parker was initially pissed, but he said it looks like they want to fight together. So they got us an eight-man tag on Rampage. So Rampage and the match that they got on Rampage was really nothing more than a setup because the acclaimed and 
the JS, it looks like they will be feuding going forward, which I don't mind at all. I actually think that both teams are very entertaining. The back and forth between them has been entertaining. I'm not sure where else it's going to go. I'm not sure where, where, where else this feud could go, but it's going to be entertaining nonetheless. So we'll see what comes out of it. Although I do think that this is just a little interim feud for the acclaimed before they get back to fighting for the tag team titles. The best part of the night, MJF Day. MJF Day celebration. MJF received the key to the city as well. MJF brought in a fucking jazz band. Yeah, yes, you heard me correctly. This motherfucker had a jazz band with drums and trumpets and trombones. This guy comes out and he starts singing... Pennies from Heaven by Frank Sinatra. And I'm sitting here laughing my fucking ass off. And he's making he's 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 making the fucking saxophone player laughing. And above all else, the guy's fucking scatting. The guy the guy is fucking scatting in 2023. Who the fuck scats in 2023? And he got it over. Is there anything that this man can't do? The guy's fucking singing Frank Sinatra and fucking scatting on live television and all the wrestling fans are cheering it. Unbelievable. So MJF came out and he was presented with the key to the city. He trashed Guevara, Darby Allin, and Jungle Boy and he talked about having ADD. I actually got the crowd to chant ADD. He then tells a story about Mrs. Benedict saying, Maxwell, answer this question on the board. And she laughed at him when he said, I don't know. And he, and she goes, you see class, don't be like Mr. Friedman. Max then said his brain always goes to pro wrestling. Mrs. Benedict, I want to be a world champion. Mrs. Benedict said the possibilities of that happening are slim to none. He proved Mrs. Benedict wrong, and he said, Long Island kids, don't be like Mrs. Benedict. Don't be a stupid bitch. You can be anything you want, well, except me. Because my name is Maxwell Jacob Friedman, and I'm better than you, and you know it. He then said, you want to hear an encore? So he went up to the stage, and some guy with cymbals crashed them, and he was off tempo. MJF was talking to the crowd, and Jungle Boy unmasked to be to be the individual with the symbols. We got a big brawl. They pulled him apart before Sammy Guevara came out, and he held up the world championship. He held up the world championship, and MJF was not happy. Excellent. Favorite segment of the night. This one segment alone, MJF singing Pennies from Heaven, was better than anything that we saw on Monday Night Raw. Fact. Fact. So Sammy, he took on Commander. Sammy took on Commander. And, you know, if you're not familiar with Commander, I think that you really should start getting acclimated with him because Commander is fucking awesome. Commander is great. Commander is a fucking at what he does. Commander is awesome. So Sammy wasted no time. We had a big springboard moonsault to the floor on Commander. Shooting star press attempt by Commander, but Sammy Guevara, he kicked out. Commander was then caught in midair with a huge knee right to the face, right to the face, and then Commander, Commander, he was on the defense. Coming back from commercial, Commander delivered a beautiful springboard poison rana for two up to the top rope commander with a tightrope Fosby flop to the outside onto Sammy Guevara. Sammy Guevara, Sammy Guevara then, he was caught with a springboard Phoenix splash for a two. Commander walked the ropes. Sammy pulled him down into a cutter, pulled him down off the ropes, It was a sloppy-looking cutter, but he got it. 
go to hell or the go to hospital, whatever Sammy calls it. Sammy connects with it and Sammy pins, Sammy pins Commander and Sammy Guevara continues to win matches as Maxwell Jacob Friedman looks on as the Pillars continue to win matches on television. So Sammy then brought up the fact that he does something that the world champion doesn't do, wrestle on weekly TV. So Sammy had the mic. He mentioned that when they fought, him and MJF, when they fought back in Jacksonville, it was Sean Spears and a chair that beat me. It was not you. MJF lied and manipulated his way to get to the top. He was Cody's friend, then he was in the inner circle, then he was in the pinnacle, then he was in the firm, then he's not. You sold your soul to be a pillar, but I built this brick by brick. And whether you like it or not, I'm not going anywhere. And I'll be damned if I let some rich bitch from shitty Long Island, of all places, tear it down. Screw Darby, screw Jungle Boy, screw MJF, because Sammy Guevara is your world champion. Sammy Guevara, let me tell you something. He, he's had problems in the past, and I'd like to hope that he is getting himself back on the right track, but Sammy Guevara, Sammy Guevara, he knows how to get heat. Sammy Guevara is a great, great heat magnet. Sammy Guevara has taken the real-life heat that he got from back in the day. He's taken the real life heat that he got and he's manifested that into heat on television while getting himself better backstage. And you know what? That is respectable. That is respectable. And that is something that I praise Sammy Guevara for. That's great. That was great. I'm telling you that this fatal four way match with all the pillars, it's going to be something. Gonna be fucking something. Ethan Page versus Hook. This was for the FTW Championship. Uh, Matt Hardy hit Ethan Page with the FTW title, and it looks like Matt Hardy and Isaiah Cassidy are done with Ethan Page. Page passed out to the Red Rum, and I'm not sure if this means that Jeff Hardy is coming back, but I guess we will see. But, you know, Matt Hardy being away from Ethan Page, that's definitely good because we, quite frankly, don't need that. The biggest announcement, the biggest announcement that we got, Nigel McGuinness and Tony Khan were backstage, and Tony Khan announced that on August 27th in London, AEW All In, All In will be coming to the United Kingdom, and Adam Cole announced that it's going to be in Wembley Stadium, which is getting a professional wrestling event for the first time in 30 years. That's awesome. That is awesome. Tony Khan, he knows how to make an impact. He knows how to get people talking. And above all else, above all else, this right here shows everyone that, that Tony Khan, he's got balls. Tony Khan has got balls. Tony Khan has got a lot, and I mean a lot, of confidence in himself. And Tony Khan is not going to allow anyone to tell him what he can't and cannot do. Tony Khan is going to go out there, and Tony Khan is going to put forth his best foot. He's going to put forth everything that he has, and whether they sell out or not, Will they sell out? I don't know. That remains to be seen. It's a possibility because on ITV, on ITV, apparently Dynamite gets 2.8 million view viewers in the UK. They're actually beating both Raw and SmackDown. And you know what? If that's the case, if that's the case, then they have a decent chance of selling out. But Wembley Stadium, this is a big deal. Not only is this going to be a big deal for the company, but this is going to be a big deal for Tony Khan. This is going to be a big deal for professional wrestling fans because Tony Khan is all about creating memories. He's all about creating moments. And now that Wembley Stadium is getting ready to host AEW All In, now that we've got Wembley Stadium set to host AEW All In, 
This is going to be a big deal in terms of the company. It's going to be the largest audience in AEW history. We're bringing wrestling to a stadium that hasn't held it. It's a much easier travel than Principality Stadium in Cardiff, Wales. We are going to have a great card. He's going to put all these big names on the card. Potentially, we could see the return of CM Punk. We could see the return of CM Punk, whether you like it or not. We could see the return of Punk. We could see maybe a Punk versus Omega match. MJF's going to have a big match on the show. It is going to be a big deal because it is going to put the audience in the United Kingdom in front of AEW, and AEW is going to give the United Kingdom something of substance. It is going to be great for branching out outside of the United States for AEW. I can't wait for it. I cannot wait for it at all. It's going to be great. It is going to be such a great moment. It's going to be such a great show. It's going to be a great feeling. And people are still going to find a way to shit on it. People will still find a way to shit on it if they don't sell out. Now that right there, that's a fucking joke. Blackpool Combat Club. Blackpool Combat Club. They faced a couple of jobbers. They just destroyed them. So the Blackpool Combat Club, they made quick work of these jobbers. And then Daniel Bryan, Bryan Danielson, whatever you want to call him, Bryan took the mic and he goes, I love my family and I also love the Blackpool Combat Club. I love Yuta even though he's a little shithead. We are the only pro wrestlers in the building. Hell, we are the only pro wrestlers in the industry. Adam Page then came out. The BCC swarmed him. Brian then called him an amateur. He was trash-talking Page as Yuta, Moxley, and Claudio were all beating him down. He then had a screwdriver, and then he said that the house that is AEW has to be fixed up from all these amateurs. He then gouged at Hangman's eyes with the screwdriver, and that was the end of that segment. And it's going to be a really, really, really fun moment. And it's going to be a really fun feud with the Blackpool Combat Club and the Elite. And whatever we're going to get at Double or Nothing, I'm telling you, it is going to be fucking big. It's going to be fucking big and it's going to be fucking good. FTR. FTR versus The Guns. AEW World Tag Team Championships, titles versus careers. Title versus careers. So, the Guns had a great entrance. I believe they came out to 50 Cent. Now, I'm not sure who made that call, but I actually thought that that was a great, great, great move. And it really, really, really made the... Really made the the guns themselves feel more important than they really are. Now, I actually wish that the title reign would have lasted a little bit longer, but that's just me. That's just me. But at the end of the day, this was a very good match, and FTR remain the AEW World Tag Team Champions. They win the championships, and they remain with AEW. They remain with the company, and I wonder what changed there. They probably saw what was going on in WWE and said, fuck this. I don't need WWE. WWE don't even deserve the services of FTR. So the guns were trying everything in order to get themselves disqualified um, using the championship and low blowing them. And we had feet on the ropes. FTR hit the shadow machine. Colton pulled the ref out. Wheeler was then sent to the post. We had a famous by Austin, but Dax kicked out. Austin went for a pedigree. Dax reversed it. Back and forth, ro- back and forth roll ups. Low blow. The ref saw it. The ref went for a DQ, but Cash Wheeler stopped the referee. The guns then hit the flatliner flapjack combo on Cash. Dax fought back. Colton tried for a title, and they used the other one. Dax. Dove off the top with a headbutt onto the title. One, two, Dax kicked out. Austin couldn't believe it. 
Then Wheeler came off the top with a double pin, and it was a little sloppy towards the end. Little sloppy towards the end, I will say. But nevertheless, we had a double roll up, double pin, and Dax and Cash win the AEW World Tag Team titles for the second time in their career. They now join the Young Bucks as the only two teams to hold the tag team titles twice. And we got ourselves a whole new open door of possibilities with FTR as the World Tag Team Champions. And it's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be fun. I like it. I like it a lot. Really, really, really good stuff. And in the end, in the end, FTR remains with AEW, thankfully. Outside the ending, which was kind of kind of a little wonky, don't really understand why, but nevertheless, nevertheless, still, still a very, very, very good show. And in the end, in the end, that's it. FTR, stay with AEW, and we move on. Now, it all depends on what's going to happen at the pay-per-view. Now, if anything, I'm not sure what's going on with the Acclaimed, but I think that we could absolutely get the Guns and the Acclaimed and FTR in a triple threat tag team match. I think that, that would be very good. That would be very good for the pay-per-view. So that was AEW Dynamite. We then move on to AEW Rampage and Battle of the Belts, and I will be the first to tell you that I really do not, I do not like the fact that they are doing, do not like the fact that they are doing a fucking, a fucking dual night of Battle of the Belts, Battle of the Belts, and Rampage on the same day. I, I don't like that. I really, really, really don't like that. I think that that is way too much. It's overkill. I would honestly move Battle of the Belts to Saturday. Move it back to Saturday. We really do not need it on a Friday. We don't. No one wants to be sitting there till 12 a.m. watching wrestling no matter where you are. Really. So... We did get some fun stuff on Rampage, though. Battle of the Belts was better, but we did get some fun stuff on Rampage. Rampage, we got Ethan Page versus Hook for the FTW Championship in an FTW Rules match. This was a fun little match right here. Page went right after Hook, and they brawled into the crowd. Crowd was loving it. Coming back to commercial, they were at ringside. Hook delivered a T-bone suplex on the floor. Hook then brought out the chairs. Page... Then came back with a power slam to hook through the timekeeper's table for a two. Page accidentally bounced a chair off of his head. And then we get a twist of fate by Hook. Page kicked out. Red rum by Hook and Page taps out. Afterwards, Hook, he gave the crowd what they wanted. There was a table set up in the corner. And we saw... We saw Hook deliver a T-bone suplex to add uh, Ethan Page through a table. And that was it. Hook and what he's doing continues to be great. Hook continues to evolve. Hook continues to grow. And I'm very, very happy in seeing Hook continuing to move forward and continuing to evolve as a professional wrestler. When Hook moves away from the FTW Championship, when Hook starts getting higher up the card... He is going to excel. They have not overexposed Hook. They've treated him very, very well. Hook is really, really, really doing some good stuff. And Hook is only going to get better. He's only going to get better. The Acclaimed and 2.0. They took on Bobby Orlando, LSG, and the Infantry. This lasted about two minutes. And the Acclaimed got the win with a mic drop. The Acclaimed actually refused to scissor 2.0, which resulted in the JAS attacking the Acclaimed, and that was pretty much it. So it looks like we got an official feud between them. Really nothing overly exciting, but I mean, I think that the Acclaimed in 2.0 are going to put on a pretty decent little program. It's going to be a nice little interim program before we get the Acclaimed moving on to the tag team titles once again. So we got ourselves Swerve Strickland. He announced 
that he has officially joined forces with someone. He is merged with someone. And we found out a little later who that is. And I actually really like this merge. So Lee Moriarty, he took on Darby Allen. They put on a decent little match. Lee Moriarty got a solid amount of offense in here. Lee Moriarty dropped Darby Allen from the top rope. Darby came back with a small cradle. Prawn pinned by Moriarty for a two. Darby with a beautiful code red. Tope Suicida on Big Bill. And then a coffin drop on Moriarty's back. Darby then won it. Afterwards, afterwards, all of a sudden, Swerve came out to confront Darby Allen, and it was Brian Cage. Brian Cage that came out and attacked Darby Allen. And it looks like we got ourselves Swerve and the Mogul affiliates. They have merged with the embassy, which I think is fucking awesome. Look, if we're going to see the embassy on AEW television more often, I am all for that. I actually think that the embassy fits better with Swerve than Parker Boudreaux and Trench did. I think that putting these, these guys with Swerve is absolutely going to help. And if we see the embassy on AEW television, I'm all for that. Think about the match that we can have with the embassy. Embassy versus the Elite. Embassy versus the House of Black. Embassy versus the, the, the Best Friends in Orange Cassidy. Embassy versus fucking the Jericho Appreciation Society. The Embassy versus Sting, Darby Allen, and whoever else they want to join. The Embassy is awesome. The Embassy is great. So I actually like that merger. Next week on Dynamite, we actually got a big show. We got Keith Lee versus Chris Jericho, which should be very good. We also got Swerve Strickland versus Darby Allen. And then... It looks like we're also getting Moxley and Claudio versus Michael Nakazawa and Brandon Cutler. So it looks like they're going to start getting serious. Anna Jay and Julia Hart, they main evented Rampage, which I don't know why. Don't know why. This was a really, really shit way to go into Battle of the Belts. I mean, I've seen worse wrestling matches, but I mean, these two women clearly are not ready for a spot like that. These two women clearly are not in a position where they should be main eventing any show on AEW television, even Rampage. Julia Hart, I will say, Julia Hart's gotten better. She actually looked pretty decent here, coming in with some nice moonsaults, and she delivered a nice Hurricane Rana. But at the end of the fucking day, I mean, these two women, they're not in-ring leaders. These two women are not in-ring leaders. These two women are not individuals that... We should be investing our time. In, they, they're just not. They're, they're really not. And I don't really understand why. I don't really understand why we are pushing Julia Hart and Anna Jay when they don't really have anything to do with each other outside of what's going on with the JS and the House of Black. And even then, that storyline's over. That storyline's over. It looks like Chris Jericho is going to move on to Adam Cole now. Don't understand. But at the end of the day, they main evented Rampage. Not a fan of it at all. Julia Hart won with the Poison Mist in a small cradle. So it looks like the House of Black continuing to gain momentum. Anna Jay, I don't know what's going on with Anna Jay, but Anna Jay should not be put in the ring with Julia Hart. You put her in the ring with Serena Deeb. You put her in the ring with fucking, with fucking Willow Nightingale. Or you put her in the ring with Ruby Soho. You'll get a decent match there, but not with Julia Hart. Julia Hart is not an in-ring leader. She's not. So that was a real shit way to go into Battle of the Belts 6, but Battle of the Belts was not a bad show at all. Battle of the Belts had a couple of decent matches on it. We had Dralistico, Dralistico and Orange Cassidy kick off Battle of the Belts. This was for the AEW International Championship. I have been vocal, and I will say this. I have been vocal in saying that Orange Cassidy needs to drop the All-Atlantic Championship. He does. But I mean, holy shit. Oh, holy shit. I mean, this man's on the run of his life. This man is legitimately on the run of his life right now. Orange Cassidy is legitimately doing the best work of his career. 
He's like Sheamus. He's putting on banger after banger after banger after banger after banger. Anyone that denies Orange Cassidy after the run that he's been on and the matches that he's been having, I don't, I don't think that you should be talking pro wrestling at all. You really shouldn't. Orange Cassidy is doing some great shit as the All-Atlantic champion. I think that he's probably one of the longest reigning champions in AEW right now, outside of Jay Cargo. Orange Cassidy, he, he right now is doing God's work. West wrestling every week, putting on great matches with everyone. That is to be respected. And after this title reign's over, I think a lot of people are going to respect Orange Cassidy. Roosh Andralistico. I've been loving Roosh Andralistico on Ring of Honor television. So, Dralistico, Dralistico, we had Dralistico in control early with some very quick offense. Cassidy just lightly chopped Dralistico. Cassidy with the hands in his pockets. We had a drop kick to Dralistico. Thumbs up for the crowd. Crowd was actually chanting, holy shit, holy shit, because of this. We then saw Dralistico dive onto the best friends on the floor with a Tope Con hero. Back in the ring, Dralistico. He was caught with a diving crossbody. And a Mishinuku driver by Orange Cassidy for a two. Satellite DDT by Orange Cassidy. That got a two count. Dralista go with a springboard code breaker, which I love. I think that move is great. That got a two. Dralista go with a springboard code breaker for a two. Stun Dog Millionaire by Cassidy. Cassidy and Dralista go were on top. Dralista go with a springboard Hurricane Rana off the top rope. Fujiwara armbar locked in. Cassidy got to the ropes. Canadian Destroyer, and a corkscrew kick by Dralistico. Cassidy kicked out. V-trigger. V-trigger by Dralistico. Orange punch to Dralistico, and Cassidy retains in a very good match. Afterwards, the House of Black called out Orange Cassidy for a title match, and next week we will see Buddy Matthews versus... Orange Cassidy for the All-Atlantic Championship. Now, I don't think that Buddy Matthews is beating Orange Cassidy, but I mean, if there's any individual that I'd love to see take the AEW International Championship from Orange Cassidy, I would love to see Malachi Black. I would love to see Malachi Black take that championship from Orange Cassidy. Him holding two championships would really solidify him, and after all the shit that he had to go through... That would definitely, definitely make up for the poor booking that he received throughout 2022. And the fact that the House of Black, finally they're getting what they deserve in 2023, that right there, that right there makes me happy. So that was a very good match with Cassidy and Dralistico. Billy Starks and Jade Cargill for the TBS Championship. Certainly not Jade Cargill's best match. She looked a little stiff in there. But we got a match that was decent enough between Billy Starks and Jade Cargill. And Billy Starks, I got to say, the future looks very, very bright for the women's division. It really does. Billy Starks is 18 years old. Billy Starks is 18 years old. And she actually wrestles better than... Like about 25% of the wrestlers in the women's division in AEW and half of the wrestlers on WWE's women's division. I don't know what she does, but it's like she was almost bred to do this. Billy Starks is awesome. And the crazy part about it is she's only going to get better. That's the insane part about all this. Billy Starks is only going to get better. And I cannot wait to see what the future holds for the young lady known as Billy Starks. So Cargill didn't take too kindly to Billy Starks slapping her. Cargill was caught with a series of forearms and then a backstabber. Cargill with a fallaway slam. Jade then sent Billy through the ropes. Coming back from commercial, Starks with a Hurricane Rana and a wrecking ball drop kick to Jade. Jade was then caught with a spin kick and then a roll up for a two. Flatliner by Starks to Cargill. Swanton Bomb missed. The knees were up by Jade. Punt kick, jaded, and Jade retains. Taya Valkyrie then came out and dropped Jade, and she almost delivered a jaded. She almost delivered a jaded 
to Jade, or what is she? She's calling the road to Valhalla. And it looks like, I hope at least, I like to hope, cross your fingers, that we will see a new TBS champion in Taya Valkyrie because at this rate, we have seen Jade Cargill do all that she possibly can with the TBS championship. And I really think that it's time to move on from Cargill. I would absolutely give Taya Valkyrie the championship. The Lucha Bros. Lucha Bros versus QT Marshall and Powerhouse Hobbs. This was for the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Championships. This match didn't make any sense from the beginning. I really don't know why this match was even made. It didn't make any sense from the beginning. And quite frankly, quite frankly, it seemed rather stupid. It seemed rather stupid that this match was even a thought in anyone's mind. I don't really understand why we need QT Marshall and Powerhouse Hobbs as a tag team fighting the Lucha Bros. But regardless of that, I, I think that we kind of knew it was going to be a very good match. And that's what we got. That's what we got. Uh, I could do it without QT Marshall on television. And I, I will say this. He's not a ratings grab. He may be a charisma vacuum. And he may be probably one of the most insignificant individuals on AW television. But I really do believe, I really think that we should all be in the same boat when I say that QT Marshall, QT Marshall is a very good wrestler. He's a very, very good professional wrestler. And this match, whether anyone wants to admit it or not, this match was very good. So Lucha Bros, they were in control. Drop kick by Phoenix. Tope Suicida on QT. Hobbs then shut down Penta. Body slammed to Phoenix. Hobbs was in control coming back from commercial. Penta was isolated. Nice suplex powerbomb by QT for two. Phoenix got the tag. We had a spin kick by Phoenix on QT. Tight rope. Rana, very nicely done. Double wheelbarrow uh, splash. A double wheelbarrow splash on QT. That got it too. Penta with a diving crossbody and an assisted DDT. I believe that was on Hobbs. Diving splash by Phoenix. Hobbs saved it. QT, handspring Enziguri. Pounce by Hobbs, backstabber by Penta, diamond cutter by QT, flip bomb by Phoenix. All four men were down. That was a very nice sequence. Penta then chopped Hobbs. Hobbs was unaffected by it. Hobbs then caught with a tightrope PK by Phoenix. Tagged to Phoenix. Phoenix dove off of Penta's shoulders with a splash. And then Penta, Penta, Dove off of Phoenix's back into a destroyer on, on QT. Hobbs kicked out of the splash. Tagged QT. Spin kick by Phoenix. Alex Abrahantes got low blowed by Harley. QT with a roll up. Phoenix kicked out. Phoenix then with a, with a Hurricane Rana counter. And the Lucha Bros retain the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Championships. And they could be holding those championships for a decent amount of time going forward. And it looks like that, that is going to be a big deal going forward with the Lucha Bros running Ring of Honor as its tag team champions. Before we get out of here, I do have a couple more pieces of news that we're going to talk about. Apparently... L.A. Knight was also slated to do a segment with Bobby Lashley on night two of WrestleMania 39 before the segment was next. It's unclear what happened. Vince McMahon happened. And it was noted that L.A. Knight had stated that WrestleMania would be getting an L.A. Knight moment, further proving my point that I ranted about in the beginning of the stream. L.A. Knight could very well be as good as gone with Vince McMahon back in charge. And finally, this is actually the bigger piece of news. Drew McIntyre 
was pulled from this week's SmackDown, as well as a meet and greet in Portland, Oregon, according to PW Insider. Now, I've heard conflicting reports on this. Reportedly, it's a health issue. Reportedly, he's not happy. Reportedly, Drew is not happy with what's going on with his new contract deal. Reportedly, reportedly, Drew McIntyre is not happy with the money or the creative. And you know what? If that if that is an indication of anything, that really, 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 really shows you just how affected even Drew McIntyre is about this entire situation. I'm not saying that it's a fact that Drew McIntyre is going to leave or he's unhappy with the money and the creative direction in his contract. But I mean, if you don't think that that's a possibility, I think you're sorely mistaken. No one, no one is immune to bad creative. And you can imagine that Drew McIntyre, he is beyond fucking pissed. He's beyond pissed that he hasn't really been able to break out of anything other than being a mid-carder. And people want to fucking joke about, oh, how Drew McIntyre is going to be sentenced to AEW Dark. No, motherfucker. Drew McIntyre, if he goes to AEW, they are going to treat Drew McIntyre like the fucking God as he is. And if Drew McIntyre, whether he asks for his release, whether he just rides out his contract, I'm telling you, Drew McIntyre would absolutely walk out if he does not feel that he is being used correctly. And he will not stay in WWE if it meant money and money only. No one, no one is immune to it. Drew McIntyre is not immune to it. And if, and if, let me tell you something. If there would be one individual that would absolutely benefit from jumping ship, I mean, holy shit, Drew McIntyre and AEW, think of the fucking matches that we could have. Drew versus Kenny, Drew versus Hangman, Drew versus Darby and Sammy and MJF and Malachi Black and Powerhouse Hobbs and Wardlow and all these other fucking individuals. Think about how fucking good Think about how fucking good Drew, if if Drew McIntyre asks for his release and we get Drew Galloway coming in at Wembley Stadium, just imagine, just imagine the fucking reaction. That would be fucking unbelievable. Unbelievable. I'm telling you. I am telling you. It is absolutely a fucking possibility that we could very well get Drew McIntyre leaving WWE. Do I think it's going to happen? I don't know. I'd probably go with no, considering that Drew McIntyre has really made WWE the place where he goes. But it's a possibility. It is a possibility. I'm not going to say it's not. I think that we should absolutely keep our minds open. And at this rate, it could just be a wait-and-see scenario. It could just be a wait-and-see scenario. But, but... Ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up this edition of the Lightning Flash Update. Hope you guys enjoyed that rant in the beginning. If you guys missed it, you can go and check it out. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe no matter where you're watching. Follow me on all platforms, social media. All those links are in the description. Hardcore Sports, we are taking over. And I hope you guys have a wonderful, 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 wonderful Easter weekend. If you celebrate, I'm DJ Storms. This has been the Lightning Flash Update. We're back to the grind. New streaming software here on Melon. Hopefully this is going to work out great going forward. But before we get out of here, people, I got to know, tell me, people, who runs the IWC? Tell me. Because if you ain't going to tell me, then I'll tell you. Who runs the IWC? And everyone's going to get this through their heads. Who but DJ motherfucking Storms. And don't you forget it. Because we want retribution. Oh yeah, we want retribution. Oh yeah, we want retribution.